Today we're going to take a, take a look at frequency distributions, statistical charts, and graphs. When looking at a large number of data points, it is often useful to organize the data into a chart, table, or graph. A frequency distribution organizes the data points and the frequency with which they occur. So for example, a class was surveyed to find out how many classes each student is taking this semester. The results are listed below. Looking at the data this way, it's hard to really tell what's going on, how many classes are taken, you know, how many students are taking one class, two class, three class, whatever. So I turned it into a chart where I have the number of classes listed with, along with the frequency. So here you can see that 11 students take one class, 8 students take two classes, 7 students are taking three classes, and 4 students are taking four classes. A relative frequency distribution finds the percent of the sample that each data point represents. To find the relative frequency distribution, divide the frequency of the data by the total number in the distribution and then multiply the answer by 100. So if we return to our beginning example um, about the number of classes students were taking, um, you can see there are 30 data points, so when I added up my frequency, there's 30. So I'm going to go back to the frequencies and divide each frequency by 30 and then multiply by 100. So instead of saying that 11 students take one class, I can say 36.7% of the students are taking one class. I could say 26.7% are taking two classes, 23.3% are taking three classes, and 13.3% are taking four classes. A histogram gives data along the horizontal axis and the frequency on the vertical axis. Histograms are typically referred to as bar charts. So once again, I have the same data we were talking about, which was the number of classes taken by students. And you can see here that I put the frequency um, 0 up through 12 because 11 was our highest number we used. And then the number of classes 1, 2, 3, and 4. <clears throat> A frequency polygon is just a line chart. So once again, I took the um, numbers we've been talking about, the number of classes taken by a student, and I put them um, on a line chart, which we call a frequency polygon as well. And you can see how the data points are connected, and I have the numbers showing on the outcome, so you can really read um, how many classes each person took. Um, one more time with this data, as I turned it into a pie chart, so when you look at the pie chart, there are sections that are color coordinated. So the orange represents taking one class, that's 37%. The blue is taking two classes, 27%. The red is taking three classes, which is 23%. And then the yellow represents taking four classes, and it shows it's 13%. So let's switch examples, and let's say we look at real estate sales. Um, so in this um, frequency distribution, um, what I have is the month, so January, February, March, April, May, June, and then the sales in thousands. So that 500 represents 500,000, where it says 2,500, that would be like 2,500. All right, so I took that data, and then I just displayed it in a graph, so you can see that really sales were pretty low in January and spiked um, to their highest point in May. I could take that same data and turn it into a frequency polygon. Um, so here, same numbers, just taking the data points and connecting them with lines. Um, here's the big difference in this, is when I go back and look here as a bar chart, yeah, I can see the low and the high. Um, when I change it into a frequency polygon, it kind of feels like there's movement, right? That You see sales are going up from January until they get to May, and then May I see them dropping again. So a line chart or frequency polygon sometimes gives like some direction of increasing, decreasing that we don't get from a bar chart. When there are a large number of data outcomes, data is often grouped into classes. Common rules for grouping data are there should be um, between 5 and 12 data classes. Each data point should only belong to one data class. All data classes should be the same width, and the data classes should not overlap. So here, um, I have weights of football players, and you can see they're kind of all over the place. Um, I 
think I did keep them all in order though. So you can see the smallest of 175 um, going all the way up to 338. So this is a large, large number of values to go by. So what I did is I grouped them. So from 175 to 338 was a range of 163 pounds. So I made that into eight data classes. And to keep them um, all the same, you'll see I actually went a little higher than 338. Um, so here you can t tell what I did. I went from 175 to 195, then 196 to 216, 217 to 237, 238 to 258, right? And then I just kept going. So you can see I added 20 each time. So that's my class width would be 20. Then after I set up my class widths, then I went back and I looked at how often did each of these class widths occur. Um, so you can see the numbers in there. 11 of the players were 175 to 195. 18 were between 196 and 216. 21 were from 217 to 237. Um, 9 were from 238 to 258. 6 in each of the categories of 259 to 279 and 280 to 300. 11 between 301 and 320. And then just 4 from 321 to 341. All right. Once again, if I wanted to, I could turn that into a relative frequency distribution. So the first thing I would need to do is say, how many football players were we considering here? So I add up the frequencies and it says I had 86 um, outcomes there. So I took each of the frequencies and I divided them by 86. And that just gives us um, some kind of way to relate that particular weight class to the entire population. So like if we wanted to know what was most frequent, from ours we had 24.4% or 217 to 237. I could talk about the percent that weigh more than 300 pounds by adding the 12.8 and 4.7. So I get more information, more things I can manipulate once I put it into these distributions. Um, we can talk about things like modal classes, where the modal class is the class with the highest frequency. So in our example of looking at the football players, 217 to 237 was the most frequent um, weight class. When I'm looking at the modal class, we usually do talk about frequency, but it wouldn't change it at all if I went back to the percents. It's also going to have the highest percent, the 24.4. So even though traditionally we talk about modal being frequency, you could do percentages and it would be the same. All right. So we're going to do another example. Um, this one is the data below represents gas prices for one gallon of premium gasoline at 20 gas stations. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I see is a little, little looks like it's 227, and I don't have these necessarily in order. They're kind of scattered all around, but it does look like the first one's the lowest and the last one's the highest. All right. So once again, I needed to group the data. Um, so you can see here's how I started it. I started at 225 and I went up to 249. Um, so my width is four for each of these. So 225 to 229, 230 to 234, right? You can see I keep going. And, and after I made up my, um, my class widths, I could go back and put their frequency in there. So I have a four, four, six, four, and two. So some of them are about the same, 444, four, four, but that 6, definitely my high, my modal class, and then I definitely had a low at 245 to 249. You can also see I put this together as a histogram or a bar chart, which I also draws your eye to the fact that that 6 happens the most, and then uh, from 235 to 239, and then you can see what happens the least, and the other ones are pretty, pretty much the same. All right, so what would be the next class of data? So if I'm looking at this and I wanted to add more data, right, if I had some gas that was more expensive, what would it be? And then what is the modal class? All right, so the next set of data, if I continued this chart, would start at 250 and go to 254. So there's maintaining that um, space between them of 4 cent. And then the modal class we said was 235 to 239. A problem with group data is you can't tell what the smallest and largest values of the data actually are. Um, so if we wanted to get around that, we could add a different kind of chart, and this was called a stem and leaf display. 
Um, the stem is the major unit and the leaf is the smaller unit. So it could be dollars as the major and cents as the minor. It really depends on the individual data set we're looking at. So in this data set where I was looking at gas prices per gallon, as I look at it, it makes sense to say what's in the $2.20, what's in the 230, what's in the 240. So I make that my stem is the 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. 2 and the leaf um, is that smaller unit. So you can see as I went through, like let's take this 227 for example, I just grabbed the 7 and I put it over here. And then I got to the 231 and you can see the 1. And 235 and here's the 5. It's important to notice, see how there's two 9's? It's because 239 happens more than once. It happens twice in the data. Um, same thing here, 233 happens more than once. 235 happens more than once. So you want to keep the frequency when you put the stem and leaf display together. Um, typically, it's also written from smallest to largest as you write it out because it makes it easier to organize the data that way. So you definitely put in the repetition when it happens. You do put in the zeros if that's the unit that you have. So if I have $2.30, I need the zero to tell me that that's what happened. What's nice about the stem and leaf display is I can tell you the smallest gas price was $2.27. I can say the largest was $2.47. I didn't lose any of the data. Um, it doesn't tell me frequency per se the way it did the other one. I could count the frequency I wanted, but I don't have the percents. That's okay. I can tell you the 230s were more common than the 220s and the 240s. So there's a lot of information here. It's just organized in a much different way. All right. Um, so in this next one, I want to do another stem and leaf, and I just wanted to show you a different... Um, stem with a different leaf. And so here I took the height of um, basketball players. So the stem is the number of feet tall the basketball player is, and then the leaf is the number of inches. So here's what I want you to do in this one. I want you to find the height of the smallest player. I want to find the height of the tallest player, and then tell me how many players are on the team. All right. So the height of the smallest player would be 5 foot 10. I can see on the feet 5 and then 10 is the smallest. And then the height of the tallest player would be 7 foot 2. Okay. Then to calculate how many people are in there, I just counted up the um, data points and it said there are 15 members of this team. Okay. Another kind of chart to talk about that we looked at earlier is a pie chart or a circle graph. Um, so here I want you to say what percent of people, and so this says favorite car color, what percent of people prefer gray or silver? So in this particular chart, I did match the color of the pie chart to the color of the car. Um, that isn't always easy to do. I do make all of these charts in Excel. Um, and then sometimes it just randomly assigns. Sometimes it will let me change it. Sometimes it won't. Most of these match, but do you notice the gray is this one, the 14%. It says gray, 14%. Um, versus this one, this is um, that looks kind of silver. So I try to match them when I can. So the white matches the white, the black matches the black, but the red is really silver, and the silver is really red. Um, so that's just kind of assignments that come up. So be careful when um, you're given homework. I know I have an assignment online that has some color on it. I know some of the homework might as well. There's nothing that says it will give it the color it's supposed to because the computer's not reading what I put in as data. It's not actually, it's just looking at here's some data, let's assign some stuff. So be careful with that. Don't just grab to it and go, oh, I see, I see this color, so I'm going to say that as the answer. Um, so I want you to read through this, answer these three questions, and then um, come back. All right, so what people, what percent of people preferred gray or silver? So remember to look down here, the gray was 14, and the silver, which was really red, was 13. So 14 and 13 is 27. What percent don't prefer black? Well, black is really the black color. Um, so 19% of them prefer black, so I would do 100 minus 19 is 81%. And then what color is most preferred? 